back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In the next few videos, we're really going to be talking about the scapula. We're going to be talking about the scapula structure in this video, so we're going to be looking at all the bony features of it. We're then going to move into talking about the rotator cuff muscles, and then we'll begin looking at the various joints uh, by which the scapula articulates with other bones. But here's just a brief overview of the scapula. The scapula is a flat bone that comprises the insertions for most shoulder girdle muscles. So the shoulder girdle muscles are going to be muscles that produce movements of the scapula. And we'll, we'll look at those in more detail in a future video, but it suffices to say that the scapula can be elevated up, it can be depressed down, it can be uh, retracted toward the midline of the body, it can be protracted away from the midline, and it can be rotated just in place along a fixed axis. Okay? And so generally it's going to be the shoulder girdle muscles that actually produce these movements. For example, levator scapulae is a muscle that will attach to the superior part of the medial border and it elevates the scapula, thus the name levator scapulae, it's elevating the scapula. Rhomboids are going to retract the scapula. Trapezius can do a number of things and serratus anterior can actually protract the scapula, move it away from the midline of the body. So in general, shoulder girdle muscles are going to insert on some point of the scapula and they're going to produce movements of the scapula. Okay? Now rotator cuff muscles, as we'll see in the next video, they sit on the scapula. They originate on the scapula. Okay? Shoulder girdle muscles insert on the scapula. Rotator cuff muscles exist and originate on the scapula, and rotator cuff muscles actually produce movements of the humerus. Okay? So shoulder girdle muscles and rotator cuff muscles produce very different movements okay, of different bones. Now, the scapula itself articulates mainly with the clavicle, the humerus, and the ribs. Now, the articulation with the clavicle, called the acromioclavicular joint, and the articulation of the humerus called the glenohumeral joint. These two are true synovial joints, and we'll look at those structures in more detail in um, some of the following videos. It also articulates with the ribs, but this is not a true synovial joint, and for that reason it's called the scapulothoracic articulation rather than a joint. And again, we'll be looking at that in future videos as well. So now let's take a look at the scapula, posterior and anterior views, and then we're going to look at a 3D model, hopefully get a good understanding of the bony features of this bone. So here's a posterior view. So first of all, one way we can recognize that this is a posterior view is in the posterior view, that's the only view where you can really see the spine of the scapula. So this structure right here that goes along from the medial border all the way to this jutting out structure called the acromion or acromial process. This is called the spine. That tells you it's a posterior view. Notice in the anterior view, we don't see that spine. So that tells me this is anterior. Now the next question is, how do I determine if this is a left or a right scapula? Well, in general, for the scapula, assuming you're looking at the posterior view, and this is the spine, so we know it is posterior, the spine juts out and up, meaning away from the body and up. So if I follow the spine, here it's going up and out, okay? And if it's going up and away from the body, then this over here has to be the lateral side, this has to be the medial side, so this would actually be a right scapula, okay? So in other words, whatever direction it goes out and up, that is the side of the body that the scapula belongs on. So because it's going up and out to the right, this is a right scapula, okay? Now in terms of the spine, Notice that the spine goes from the medial border right here, as we mentioned, to this jutting out structure right here called the acromion or the acromial process. The acromial process or acromion is actually going to be what articulates with the clavicle to form the acromioclavicular joint. Also, the spine is going to divide uh, this part of the scapula into two basins or fossas. This one on the top is the supraspinous fossa. This will actually be the site for the supraspinatus muscle to sit in. And then below the spine is the infraspinous fossa. This will be the site for the infraspinatus muscle to sit in. Down here we have the lateral border of the scapula. This will be the site for the teres minor muscle to sit in. And then down here is the inferior angle of the scapula where the medial border intersects with the lateral border. 
Now up here, if we follow the medial border up, here's the superior angle of the scapula. Following it over here, we have the superior border. And if we look, there's a little notch right here that separates the superior border from this other structure over here that kind of curves around like a C called the coracoid process. This notch is called the scapular notch, or a better term is the suprascapular notch. Okay? We'll talk about that in more detail on the next slide at the end of this video. But this is the suprascapular notch. Now this structure over here that kind of curves around, we'll see it better on the anterior view, is called the coracoid process. Now when you're looking at the coracoid process versus the acromion, notice the acromion is really a continuation of the scapular spine. The acromion, therefore, is more posterior. The coracoid process is more anterior. So, if you're able to recognize the difference between the coracoid process and the acromion, that's another good way to determine anterior and posterior. Okay. These structures on the lateral aspect, like the glenoid fossa, also called the glenoid cavity, we'll be able to take a better look at this when we look at the 3D model. Uh, but the glenoid fossa, or glenoid cavity, is where the head of the humerus articulates with the scapula, to form the glenohumeral joint. Okay. Let's actually now move and take a look at the anterior side of the scapula. We'll see a lot of the same structures, but let's begin by looking at that glenoid fossa. So this is a slightly concave structure that again is going to serve as the articulation for the head of the humerus to form the glenohumeral or shoulder joint. Now on the glenoid fossa, on the top of it, there's a little protruding bump right there. That's called the superglenoid tubercle. It turns out that the short head of the biceps actually originates there. On the bottom of the glenoid fossa, or cavity, is the infraglenoid tubercle. It turns out the long head of the triceps brachii originates here. And this thickened area right here, which really turns into the glenoid fossa, this is the neck of the scapula. Going down here, this is again the lateral border of the scapula. Again, the lateral border is going to be the side that has the glenoid fossa, because obviously the arms and the humerus have to be lateral. So this is going to be the lateral border of the scapula. This over here is the larger medial border of the scapula. And then the intersection between the two inferiorly is the inferior angle of the scapula. Following the medial border up, we see the superior angle of the scapula. Going across here is the superior border of the scapula. And we again see that suprascapular notch, which divides up the superior border from this coracoid process. Again, we can also tell this is the coracoid process because it does not appear to originate from the spine of the scapula, whereas the acromion does originate from the spine of the scapula. It's a continuation of that. Here's the coracoid process. Here's the acromion of the scapula. Again, the acromion's further away from us because this is an anterior view, and the coracoid process is anterior, acromion is posterior. And this basin right here, that is not divided up at all, unlike in the posterior view, this is the subscapular fossa. In some cases, they'll just call it the scapular fossa, but subscapular fossa is better because the subscapularis muscle is actually going to sit there. And so all four of those muscles that I just mentioned, subscapularis anteriorly, supraspinatus superiorly, and then infraspinatus and teres minor inferiorly and posteriorly, these four muscles constitute the four rotator cuff muscles, and because they all sit in and originate on the scapula, they're going to insert on the humerus and therefore move the humerus. So they are distinct from the shoulder girdle muscles, which actually move the scapula itself. Okay, So hopefully this makes sense. Let's actually take a look at this figure right here, and then we'll take a look at a 3D model of the scapula. So this is a posterior view of the scapula, clearly. It's a right scapula because here's the spine of the scapula that tells us it's posterior. And the spine juts out away and up and away from the body in the direction that the scapula is on the side of. So because this spine goes up and out to the right, this is a right scapula. Up here is the supraspinous fossa. Down here is the infraspinous fossa. Here's the lateral border of the scapula, medial border over here much larger, inferior angle at the bottom, up here's the superior angle, and then here's the superior border, and then over here's that coracoid process, and between the coracoid process 
and the superior border, we have that suprascapular notch. Now in real life, what we would see is there's a ligament that actually connects the, the end of the superior border with the coracoid process. This is called the superior transverse scapular ligament. This ligament turns the suprascapular notch into a suprascapular foramen. The suprascapular foramen is only there when you include this superior transverse scapular ligament. And this suprascapular foramen creates an important structure here for the suprascapular nerve to move under. So we have here a suprascapular nerve and a suprascapular artery. These are going to serve the supraspinatus muscle, and eventually they're going to go and serve the infraspinatus muscle. But notice that the suprascapular nerve travels through the suprascapular foramen underneath the superior transverse scapular ligament. The suprascapular artery, in contrast, goes over that ligament. So when you're looking at these two structures, only the nerve goes through the suprascapular foramen, but they both essentially run together. Now, here's a structure right here called the spinoglenoid notch. This is a notch that's created between the scapular spine and the glenoid fossa or glenoid cavity right here. And the significance of this is once the suprascapular nerve goes underneath this ligament through the suprascapular foramen, and once the suprascapular artery goes over the ligament and they come together, they're going to go through the supraspinous fossa and then kind of loop around the spinoglenoid notch. And this is going to allow them to innervate and supply blood to, respectively, the infraspinatus. So they first go above and below the superior transverse scapular ligament, and then together they loop around the spinal glioid notch, which is going to allow them to supply the infraspinatus. So hopefully that makes sense. Now what we're going to do is we're going to look at a 3D model of the scapula, and again identify all these structures again. Alright, so now let's look at the human scapula, and let's look at the same stuff, but we'll be able to see a three-dimensional model here. All right, so here's our scapula. I've even included the clavicle right here so we can see how it articulates with the scapula. This will become important when we look at some future videos. So looking at this, is this a left or a right scapula? And also, is it anterior or posterior? Now, we should probably tell if it's anterior or posterior first. This is clearly posterior because I can see this, which is the scapular spine. If I turn this around to the other side, we don't see that spine. So we know this is anterior. And going back over here, this is posterior. And remember, the spine moves out and up in the direction that it is on the side of the body. So as the spine moves up, it moves out to the right. Therefore, this is a right scapula. Okay? If we flip this over and the spine moved out and up to the left, it'd be a left scapula. The spine moves out and up to the right, so it's a right scapula. And that trick only works if you're looking at the posterior side, because on the anterior side we can't even see the spine. So let's start by looking at the posterior aspect here, see if we can get a few things. Well, over here, this is the medial border of the scapula. So this is the medial border. We're going to see later on there's a few muscles that actually insert over here, in particular the rhomboids, rhomboid major and minor, and then sort of up here we would have levator scapulae. That will become important. So here's the medial border. Down here is the inferior angle of the scapula, and then over here is the lateral border of the scapula. Okay. If we follow the spine out, there's this projection over here, this projection right here is called the acromial process. If we look completely on the lateral end, you'll notice that this structure, which is the acromial process or acromion, is posterior to this projection right here, which is actually the coracoid process. Coracoid process is more anterior, acromial process is more posterior. And also notice that the clavicle actually articulates with the acromial process. This would actually be right here, the acromioclavicular joint, or AC joint. So we've got medial border, inferior angle, lateral border, scapular spine, and acromial process. Now if we look on top, this would actually be the supraspinous fossa. This basin on top of the scapula is actually where uh, the supraspinatus muscle would sit. On this side, beneath the spine, all this is the infraspinous fossa. 
This would actually be where the infraspinatus muscle sits. And then also attached to the lateral border, we would have teres minor. Okay, so let's actually rotate this over to the anterior side. Again, it's anterior because we cannot see the spine. So again, here we have the medial border of the scapula, inferior angle. Here's the lateral border of the scapula. And then this large basin right here on the anterior side is the subscapular fossa. Sometimes you might see it as scapular fossa, but the more correct term is subscapular fossa uh, because this is where the muscle subscapularis sits. Okay. Now if we look over here, this is the superior angle of the scapula, and right here is the superior border of the scapula. And then right here above where my mouse is, between the coracoid process and this superior border, we have this little notch right here. This is called the suprascapular notch. And remember, there's a ligament that goes over it called the superior transverse scapular ligament, which converts this suprascapular notch into a suprascapular foramen, through which, remember, the suprascapular nerve travels through. The suprascapular artery goes above the ligament, not through the foramen that's created by the ligament. Okay, a few other things. Let's look at the lateral side of this. Again, here we can see the posterior acromial process. Here's the coracoid process. And then this right here is the glenoid fossa or the glenoid cavity. Now on top of the glenoid cavity, right here, this bulge right there, where my mouse is, that's called the supraglenoid tubercle. We'll see later on that the tendon of the long head of the biceps brachii originates from that. On the bottom, this would be the infraglenoid tubercle. But this is the glenoid fossa or glenoid cavity where the head of the humerus will actually articulate. Now if we take the scapula and move it a little bit posteriorly, if we look at the region right between the scapular spine and the glenoid cavity or glenoid fossa, we see a notch right here. This is called the spinoglenoid notch. And remember we covered that a few minutes ago when we were looking at the power plane. So that's pretty much it for the structures that we can see here on the 3D model. Hopefully this helped. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.